two and a half years will be a major warfare. I believe it's going to be the beginning of judgment upon America. This was God's bullseye. The tribulation has to begin the first year of... Mark, you've discovered patterns in the heavenlies throughout history that declared war and and you've also seen patterns with God's calendar, which so many people don't understand. And so they're missing so many things regarding Bible prophecy, but you have a total understanding of God's calendar. So in these patterns, you're seeing war coming on the United States. And with these patterns and God's calendar, you're also seeing when you think the tribulation can begin. Now, let me just tell you, um, <laughs> I, I read your book and okay, and the book is America at War. We're putting it up right now, 2024 through 2026, the sons of the light versus the sons of darkness. Okay, I've read that book and I was like, Oh my goodness, everyone needs to understand what's going on. But I want to know, I want to take you back to when you, saw, like I, I remember years ago when you had talked about the blood moons. And so if you could just start there and is that really when you started seeing the patterns? Absolutely. It was back in 2008 when I discovered this. And then it started just going all over the internet until 2014, 2015, when the eclipses actually came. And everybody was writing books on my material. And I had never written a book in my whole life. I didn't take literature classes. I knew nothing about being an author. And uh, uh, Joseph Farrow's World Net Daily said, Bill, everyone's writing stuff on your material. Why don't you write a book? I, I have no idea. How to... He goes, just give me 50,000 words in the next month and we'll have our editor do it. Uh, and so we just did it. But for me, it's not so much the author that's important. It's the information. And people want the information. And I'll never forget back in 2008, I was uh, I would get up uh, in my prayer closet. And that literally was my walk in closet. <laughs> that was my prayer closet. And I was praying about four in the morning. And I had just been thinking about eclipses. I love astronomy, biblical astronomy. And all of a sudden it hit me uh, when I was looking at the dates of NASA, when these uh, four total lunar eclipses happened in a row, and all of a sudden it hit me, put these on the biblical calendar. I don't know if you uh, realize this, but if you go to NASA, there's been 12,000 total solar eclipses. They have listed over a 5,000 year time period and 12,000 total lunar eclipses. All over the when world? All over the world, 12,000, okay? But then there's several different types of solar eclipses and lunar eclipses. Your total, your partial, your penumbral, you know, hybrid, different types. And so I did the math, and it's pretty simple to do. That <clears throat> means a solar eclipse, a total, let me rephrase that, a total solar eclipse only happens every one and a half years. A total lunar eclipse only happens one every uh, one and a half years. And so here I'm thinking, what are the odds to have four total lunar eclipses in a row in a year and a half? I mean, this is just math. I use math, science, and the Bible. I don't use any of my own assumptions. And so I went to look at when those four total lunar eclipses occurred after I got hit by the Lord in my prayer closet. And they happened on Passover and Sukkot, Passover and Sukkot, or tabernacles. And Genesis 1.14, God said he created the sun and the moon for signs. Number one, not light, not heat, for signs, which only refers to a eclipse. The nice thing about eclipses, no false prophet can fake it, like Pharaoh in Egypt trying to have his magicians multiply the frogs or something. Uh, and so the other thing is, it speaks in every language. It doesn't have to be translated. And so when I saw those, I thought, oh, my goodness, when was the last time this happened? And when I looked, it happened 1967 at the Six-Day War, 1948, 49, at the, when Israel became a nation, their War of Independence, 1492, when all the Jews were kicked out of Spain. And I'm just really thinking this hasn't happened but eight times since the year 2000 or since year zero. And so I'm looking at and they all tied to historic Jewish events. 
even in 70 AD, when the temple was destroyed, there's all kinds of solar lunar eclipses right in a row. And I put that in the book so everyone can see. So I was trying to decide what, the, and this is in 2008, and I'm trying to decide what do the four blood moons in a row mean is going to happen in 2014, 2015. And I told everybody I had no idea. But as I studied, I thought it meant war. But I wasn't sure when. And so 2014, 2015 came. All the books were written about uh, what my discovery was. And, of course, nothing happened necessarily. I think some things probably did have to go back and research. And so I was trying to figure out what it was for. And I did not realize what it was for until eight years later, just this last year. It finally hit me what they were for. And what it was, when you know the Shemitah cycle, it's more than just a seven-year time period that could start randomly. No, it is the Shemitah cycle. And I realized that the 2014, 2015 four blood moons was exactly a Shemitah cycle before the year of Jubilee. And the year of Jubilee was in 1973. And according to Leviticus 25, you can only proclaim the year of Jubilee on Yom Kippur. Now, I wanted to stop for a second because, see, you have taken all of the Jubilees back to the beginning of Creation. time. So, yes. And that's also in your book, which is like this incredible reference. I've never seen anything like this. So it's like other people, like you've said, other people could say, oh, we're in a Jubilee, which is uh 49 years but like 50 right yeah right and and you explain all of that and then the the shemitah is the seven years but yes it's like you did it throughout history so you can't just say oh well this is a seven year period uh, i mean I, exactly. I learned that from you in your book i mean i didn't know this before it's very specific timetables and which predict things which i mean yes. prophesy things yes i was blown away because and then then they coincide with god's biblical feasts and then, so I'd like you to go back though, the, I know you're talking about the 2014-15, but how that also predicted the, uh, prophesied the other wars that you were talking about, you know, with those other blood moons. Well, uh, here's what's amazing. Again, I knew they were uh, prophesying or predicting war. So what happens? The Yom Kippur War happened at the very day of the beginning of the 50-year Jubilee cycle. And so then here, this October 7th, we had the Iron Swords War with Hamas attacking Israel. That was the last day of that 50-year Jubilee cycle. And so here, wow, in 1967, there were four blood moons and 68 that prophesied Yom Kippur War at the beginning of the 50-year Jubilee cycle. And then the 2014-2015 blood moons was prophesying of the Iron Swords War, which is exactly another seven years later, a Shemitah cycle. So here, the, the Jubilee year was bracketed with a war at the first day and a war at the last day of that season. Right, which you said now, Jubilee, is it 49 years or 50? Well, the Jubilee year is... The cycle is 49 years, and then the beginning of the next 49-year cycle is both the 50th year and the first year of the next 49-year cycle. So Jubilees are 50 years, but they're all in 7 times 7, 49 blocks, and then they repeat. The 49 blocks repeat, and it so happens the 50th year is the first year of the next Jubilee cycle. Just like Sunday can be the first day of the week, but it's also the eighth day. Okay, so I'd like you to, to talk about the patterns with, I mean, the American Revolution War. Oh, yeah. The Ameri yeah. the Civil War. The sure. I mean, yeah, talk I, about that. That was, I, I okay. blew me away. Well, it blew me away. Here, <laughs> as I'm looking, there are 12,000 solar eclipses over the last 5,000 years. But since America has become a nation in 1776, and as a matter of fact, did you know the 4th of July, when we became a nation that year, was the 17th of Tammuz, the very day they worshipped the golden calf. A lot of people aren't aware of that. Right. And and Tammuz is which, uh, which month of the Hebraic calendar? That's the 4th. You have uh, Nisan, Iyar, Savan, Tammuz. 
Yes, it's right. It's a month after Shavuot or Pentecost. And uh, what was amazing to me, only eight total solar eclipses have happened over the United States since we became a nation in 1776. Only eight out of that 12,000. Well, <clears throat> the total solar eclipses, when they did occur in the 1700s, the late 1700s, happened during the Revolutionary War. The three solar eclipses that happened in the 1800s happened during the Civil War. And then in the 1900s, they happened during the Vietnam War. And so it's just war, war, war. Now, here's what's amazing, Jane. Now, according to Judaism, the sun represents the Gentile nations because it's so much bigger than Israel, which represented by the moon. And so they've said when there's a total solar eclipse, it represents judgment coming on the Gentiles. Total lunar eclipse is judgment coming upon Israel. Now, of those only eight total solar eclipses over the United States, only one out of all these 12,000 eclipses, only one has covered only the United States. In other words, it didn't go through Canada, Mexico, and that was the great American eclipse of seven years ago, okay, in 2017. And that's the one that went from Oregon down through the Carolinas. Okay, so that's the only total solar eclipse. And now, exactly seven years later, uh, we have this total solar eclipse going from Mexico up to the United States and into Canada. Well, it intersects as a, at a place in southern Illinois known as Little Egypt. OK, uh, I don't, are you familiar with that term, Little Egypt, in that area? Only recently. <laughs> OK, well, what's amazing here, this eclipse is intersecting. And NASA says basically very rarely do solar eclipses intersect over a country. They're usually going all different directions. And here this one intersects exactly in a place of Little Egypt and the total solar eclipse takes place the very same day the three days of darkness took place in the original plagues at the original Exodus. Ooh. Very, very same day. And around uh, Southern Illinois there, they promote themselves as Little Egypt. They have cities called Goshen, Karnak, Thebes, Cairo. Oh, they're all around there. And, uh, I, you know, I just felt like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. And then I find out the there's this university in uh, that area and their mascot is a pyramid and the falcon god horus uh, they're just totally on egypt and so when i saw that this was going to intersect there i knew this was god's bullseye of course you got the madrid fault there who knows if anything's going to happen no i but understand I, I i um you know i was reading about eclipses and how they can affect uh, and uh, cause an earthquake. So I know a lot of people are speculating, can something happen on that fault line? Yeah, well, th the amazing thing is, there is a week after the attack on Israel, October 7th, so like October 15th or 14th, was another solar eclipse, but it was an annular, but it started at the same point in Oregon as the one seven years ago. But this leg, so to speak, went, goes down through Southern Texas. So if your listeners would think of a capital letter A with the point being in Oregon. And, and one we're gonna leg, show it. Yeah. Okay, and, and one leg going all the way through to Carolina, the other leg going down through Texas. And then this one that's coming on April 8th, uh, it's gonna be known as the Great American Eclipse again. It is like the bar of the A that goes from Mexico th across the United States up into Canada uh, in Northeast area. Well, the place where this intersects in Southern uh, Texas is known as the Texas Triangle. And now that goes from Dallas to San Antonio to Houston and back to Dallas, if you imagine a triangle there. And that is the number one place for in the United States. Well, I, you know, it's interesting to me because you're, you know, talking about, you know, people being, well, you all know what we're talking about. And, uh, but that this eclipse in 2024, does it fall on a biblical feast? Yes, that's what's amazing. Well, if, uh, yeah, it's Nissan 1. Now, Nissan 1 is huge. That is the very beginning of the religious calendar.
It is the very day God's glory fell on Moses' tabernacle, and the glory fell. It's the inauguration day of Moses' tabernacle. It's also the same day, though, that Nadab and Abihu died for offering strange incense. So Nisan 1 has a huge biblical meaning. It's the beginning, just like it's the beginning of uh, the inauguration of the tabernacle. I believe it's going to be the beginning of judgment upon America. Um, yeah, now it's also interesting because the month of Nisan, which um, that is what, uh, March, April? Yes, roughly. And it belongs to the tribe of Judah. Judah always goes first. And we know Messiah is from the tribe of Judah. And every tribe, there's 12 tribes and there's 12 months uh, on the calendar. And so Nisan went first, first month, and Judah went first. So this month definitely is assigned to the Messiah who's taken charge. Okay, now talking about, uh, when I read in your book about the marching orders and I found oh. that very interesting, I'm like, okay, um, yeah, can you explain that? <laughs> yes, yeah, what's amazing, again, I, I love the Bible. Uh, it's just it's uh, just totally in my heart and I just devour it. And what I realized, again, I went to the biblical dates and the coming eclipses, See, this one here that's coming is like uh, a starting gun that got shot, boom, and the race is on. Well, what happens, because each tribe is assigned a month, God said the after he assigned it, uh, and this is in uh, Numbers 1 and Numbers 10, he said, it's time to go to war. And so they had to dissemble the tent, Moses' tabernacle, and go to war to gain the promised land. And he gave them their marching orders. So think of a war. You have military encampments and God is organizing them, telling them it's time to go to war. It so happens the eclipses that I speak about over the next three years, 20, 24, 25, uh, 26, what happens? The eclipses are in the exact order of how they march to war. And it's this just blew me away. So that uh, both the solar and the lunar eclipses, both are in the exact order of how they march to war from the east, the south, the west, and the north. Okay, so these are the eclipses that are going to be from 2024 through? Well, all of 2020, well, basically all of 2024, all of 2025, and the spring of 2026. Okay, now with the eclipse coming in um, April, do you think war would could begin then, or is it just? Do you think that it, there's a period of time? I I think it could be anything. Uh, you know, it could start then. I'm not saying it is. Uh, uh, I'm I don't claim to be a prophet. As a matter of fact, I say we're a nonprofit ministry. <laughs> but uh, uh, the amazing thing is, I just see the patterns, and I tell everybody to put it in their pipe and smoke it like they want. But I'm just saying I see the patterns, and I know what's coming. But I, I can't say I know exactly what day it's going to start. But here's what's amazing, Jane. The first one, as I said, starts on Nisan 1, which is the tribe of Judah, which is the beginning of the religious calendar. Uh, for your listeners, scientifically, you can only have a total solar eclipse or any solar eclipse on the first day of a month. That's why it's on Nisan 1. You can only have a total lunar eclipse on the 15th day of a biblical month, not our months, because our months are based only on the sun, which is totally unbiblical, because God said the sun and the moon together is how the calendar is supposed to be done. And so what happens on the Nisan 1, the solar eclipses, that is Judah, whose mother is Leah. And then on the West, it's Ephraim, and it's Tishri 1, which is Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. And that refers to Rachel. So think of the solar eclipses as Leah and Rachel, the mothers, all right? And that's where the total solar eclipses occur. Now, as you know, they were always fighting Rachel and Leah. So what does God do? Leah gets to be first on the religious calendar, and Rachel gets to be first on the civil calendar. So they don't erase each other. They both get to be first. And oh. we have two different calendars. Oh my goodness. So very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And, 
now to me, you know, some people just go, oh, the, the calendar, that's not, not, you know, that's not, not for us. You know, we're Christians and everything. And I, I'm sorry, I can't get away from when Exodus, when God says, okay, now this, meaning Nissan, yeah. yes. you know, March, April, this will now yes. be your first month. He was very, very specific about it. Oh, and, well, <laughs> yeah. When you think about it, time belongs to the master, okay? God declared this, I'm creating the sun and the moon for the times, the, for the right calendar. Now, if you're a slave, who controls your time? When you go to bed, when you get up, when you work, how hard you work. The master controls the slave, tells him what, what time it is. It's time for him to do this. Well, we went from being Egyptian slaves to being God's slaves or God's servants. He's the one who tells us what time we are to do things. And here we think, we have the chutzpah to think, no God, I'm gonna tell you and you have to meet me on my schedule. Who would go before the king or president and has an invitation to come and meet him, let's say at noon, but the person invited said, no, 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 thank you. I can't work that in my schedule. You king, you, you come and meet me on this day at this time. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, well, you know, in your book, you explained in detail um, and also for, um, for anyone who wants to get the book, uh, the in the description will be a link to how to get the book. And um, you explain how the calendar changed. Um, oh, you, yeah. You, you know, to <laughs> me, yeah, the devil doesn't want you to know God's times and seasons. He wants you to be thrown off. But the thing that really hits me is Jesus' first coming, they knew the times and the seasons, so they didn't yes. miss it. Yes. As a matter of fact, in my book, What They'll Find Out, he was born in the 77th Jubilee. During the 77th Jubilee, and it was the 541st Shemitah cycle that he began his ministry. And we know he came for the house of Israel. He always says, go to the children of Israel first. If you write the word or name Israel in Hebrew, the total numerical value is 541. How, I mean, can imagine that? Here he's born in the 77th Jubilee. He starts his ministry in the 541st Shemitah year and Israel numerical value is 541. It's all math. And God is a master mathematician. And I tell people, if you want a job uh, or if I'm talking to you, you're on the East time zone, I'm on the West time zone. We have to agree what time or we're not going to meet. A married couple will never have a wedding if they can't agree on what time. And uh, so many people are missing. And uh, I mean, I know a lot of Christians believe in divine appointments. But you okay, don't now, now, wait, before you say that, because I just <laughs> want to tease that because he know, uh, because Mark understands the times he uh, can see also with the times and these patterns, probably when the tribulation is going to begin. But Mark, I want you to explain the patterns of the upcoming eclipses. OK, sure. I'd be glad to explain the pattern. As I was saying that the solar eclipses belong to the mothers, Rachel and Leah. The lunar eclipses apply to their handmaids, Zilpah and Bilhah. Now, we see that first total solar eclipse is, is happening on April 8th of this year, and that belongs to the tribe of Judah. And of course, he belongs to Leah. Then, <clears throat> what do we have? We have on September 18th, of 2024, we have a lunar eclipse. Now the lunar eclipse happens on the 15th of the month. Like I said, you can only have them on the 15th or the middle of the month. And that's the month of Elul, which is known as the month of repentance. So God always wants people to repent before he brings the judgment. And Gad is the son of or Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, okay? So here we have Nisan 1, the beginning of the religious calendar, then a lunar eclipse in the middle of a lull, which is the month of repentance. And this is Leah's handmaid, Zilpah. And God is wanting us to repent before the fall feast, Tishri 1, Rosh Hashanah. These 10 days are known as the days of repentance. Uh, on Rosh Hashanah, Tishri 1 is the very day Adam was created. And all of mankind appears before God over the next 10 days from Tishri 1 to Yom Kippur on Tishri 10. 
And then the heavenly court is closed and judgment is meted out the following year. Well, what do we see? The next total solar eclipse is on Tishri 1, which is Rosh Hashanah. And that's Ephraim, which is Rachel's son. We have a total solar eclipse. And then what do we have? On March 14th of 2025, we have Naphtali. Naphtali was the son of Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid. And it's on Adar 15. Adar 15. Oh my goodness, that's Purim. Purim is the very day that Amalek or <clears throat> Haman, who's in Iran, he was, they were in Sushan the palace. This is in Iran, in Persia. And Haman <clears throat> was not just uh, Amalek or an Amalekite, his Agag. If you remember Agag back in 1 Samuel, about a thousand years earlier, God said to Saul, wipe out all the Amalekites. And he wiped out some of them and he spared Agag the king. Well, it so happens Haman is an Agagite, which means he's of the royal line of the seed of Amalek. <laughs> and because Saul, who's from the tribe of Benjamin, didn't destroy the Amalekites, here a thousand years later, you have Mordecai, who is in the line of Saul, facing Haman, who's in the royal line of the Amalekites, having to face off again. Yeah, now we're going to be talking about that in an upcoming show, because there's something, there's more that's very amazing about that. And that's also in your book. But tell yes. me about the patterns more, because I mean, I find it crazy that uh, these uh, eclipses there, they're on Tishri 1, which is, it's Rosh Hashanah. Then you say, then there's one on like Nisan 1, which is the first day of the um, calendar. Yep. And then t then another one on Tishri, one with Rosh Hashanah, and then other several that are on Purim, <laughs> several yeah. that are on Purim. But it wasn't, and then yeah. Elul 15, that, I mean, there were patterns of repentance. Of, a repentance, and I'm like, I can't believe this. I can't believe these patterns. I know. And that's what's amazing is because it's the, uh, come to the marching orders, Alea has six, three on the east, three on the south, Rachel has six, three on the west, three on the north. And the very first one is uh, Judah. And then the last one of Leah's is Gad. And then it hands off to Rachel. And then the last one is Naphtali. And so the eclipses are in the exact order of how they marched when they're going to war. And that's why I believe we're going to have war over the next tw two years, two and a half years. It'll be a major warfare globally. Right. And you also have seen the pattern of when we've had eclipses before, like seven years before oh, of, yeah. of a warning. Um, yes. And that's yes. been throughout history that you saw that pattern, which is oh, another yeah. reason why you see war coming. And now explain about what you see with these eclipses, the, uh, with the Aleph and the Tav. Yes. If you remember when I was saying how it's like the capital letter A, uh, the eclipses were. That is the hieroglyphic letter, how Moses wrote. That's where we get our letter A from, is from that. The Hebrew word aleph or aluf means an ox. And God, and this is why they built a golden calf, because the calf or the cow or an ox is what represents God, because he's the one who carries the load. He's the one that goes forward. That's why it's the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, because God is one. God is first. And it's amazing that this letter A, which is the ancient picture language of the letter Aleph or God, is stamped right on the United States with these eclipses, which means this is God's judgment. How do you know if something is coincidence or if it's God? The way you know is God's calendar. That's why you have to be on the biblical calendar. Yeah. And also with the biblical calendar, you know, it's amazing because, you know, some churches you know, they believe in Pentecost, they believe in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but they, that was a, a biblical <clears throat> feast. Oh, exactly. And sometimes Christians keep Easter a month before Passover. How in the world is Easter celebrating his resurrection a month before he even dies? It's because we're on the wrong calendar. And I have a chapter in the book showing you how our calendar is so messed up from the very beginning. Yeah, and I love that uh, your ministry also sells the biblical calendars. Yes. So people could really know exactly where we where we are. 
It's amazing how pe- uh, to me the calendar. Oh, I, this is something I was going to say. Do you know of all the commandments? Most Christians think of ten, but there's actually six hundred and thirteen uh, commandments. The very first commandment God gave, He gave them in Egypt, and it was the calendar. Only one calendar He gave, and it was His calendar for them to meet with Him. We're not. We're in the world, but we're not of it. Of course, we have to use the Gregorian calendar uh, in order to uh, our relationship with the world. But God has a day timer and he wants to meet with us, not on our pagan calendar, which only uses the sun. He wants us to meet with him on his calendar. As I was saying, people believe in divine appointments, but they don't realize they're scheduled. You can have a scheduled divine appointment with the creator of the universe when you get on his calendar. Uh, which is why we created this calendar that interweaves the Gregorian calendar with the biblical calendar. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, um, I, I find it very important, and I'm, and I'm going to be very honest. I was really, really on God's calendar for a while, and then I got away from it. And I just, after reading your book, I'm like, what have I been doing? And I'll I'll be reporting to you all who've been uh, and 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 um, if and if you like what uh, Mark is saying and if you like these interviews, please subscribe to my channel. But the thing is, I'm going to keep you posted on what's going on in my life because I will just say this very very briefly. When I was really more on God's calendar, I felt like I was having way more supernatural things happening in my life. When I say supernatural things that God did, that there was no way, you know, even healing and and. There's a whole bunch of things about that, but I'm going to talk about that in another program. But um, Mark, can you also get back to, you talked about the olive, but with the eclipses with the Tav. Yes. Uh, most people, uh, Christians, think of the Alpha and Omega. It actually means the Aleph and the Tav, because that's the first Hebrew letter and the last Hebrew letter. <clears throat> and the amazing thing about the Aleph Tav, that occurs about 7,000 times in your Bible, and it's never translated, okay? It's, it's just there, and it's glossed over. It's actually in Genesis 1-1. It doesn't get translated. So there's like a, a word that's missing. But it has such great significance because it means literally the beginning and the end. We have a dictionary, and when we say from A to Z, we know that means every word in the dictionary. Well, in Hebrew, when you say Aleph Tav, that's every word in of Hebrew. And guess what? Yeshua is the word. He is the all left top. Now, every Hebrew letter is assigned a numerical value. And the letter Tav is 400. Like they have one through 10, and then they have like 10 through 100, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50. And then they have like 100 through 400. And the last letter Tav is the numerical value of 400. And the very word Tav means a sign or a mark. And uh, in Ezekiel, when God told um, the angels to put a mark, literally the word mark, on the forehead of uh, all the righteous people, what they did, they the word mark is Tav. They put a letter Tav on their forehead, which is our letter T or a cross. Here, a cross is being put on the forehead of all the righteous Jewish people. And that is God's mark. That's God's signature. And, you know, if someone doesn't know how to sign a contract, they put an X on it. X marks the spot. Well, that is God's signature. The X, thats it means signature. <laughs> and that's what it is. Well, here's the amazing thing, Jane. When you know how small the moon is, a little tiny thing, and how gigantic the sun is, how in the world can this little tiny moon, it's like a 400-story building to a one-story building. Can a one-story building block out a 400-story building? Absolutely not. So how, how does this work? It all has to do with ratios and distance and size. <clears throat> God said he created the sun and the moon for signs, right? That is Tav. That is the letter Tav. That is the number 400. So what did he do? He made the sun exactly 400 times larger than the moon. And it is exactly 400 times further away. So just like your thumb can block out someone's head, the moon can block out the sun completely. Here they look like relatively the same size in the sky. But no, 
the eclipse occurs because God created them for signs, which is top, which is 400. And so he made the sun exactly 400 times larger and 400 times further away. So totally amazing. So again, Tav, the numerical value for Tav is? 400. So it's the, exactly the same as that. And But um, how does Tav re relate to these eclipses? I mean, as far, it, <clears throat> I mean, is it, isn't there, uh, um, isn't there, is, does it form a, a Tav? Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Over the United States, when you see the one from Oregon down to the Carolinas, and then you take the one that's coming up April 8th, that goes from Mexico up through Canada, that, that's an intersecting X, which is the letter Tav. Okay, yep, totally makes sense. <clears throat> wow, okay, I, everything is so interconnected. And like you said, and numbers with the Lord. Um, yeah. Okay, now I, I want you to go into, I found it very interesting in your book when you were talking about um, when could the tribulation begin and why, <laughs> do, you think, and why do you think that? Oh, yeah, that's so important. You know, so many Christians think we're not supposed to know the day and the hour. Well, I don't know the date, let's say, but God tells us the days and the hours if we're on his biblical calendar. That's why uh, the Lord rebuked the Pharisees. He says, you can read the sky, but why can't you understand the times? Uh, and in 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, you're not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. And so that's why we need to understand we can know the seasons. I mean, Christians will tell me we're supposed to know the times and seasons. And I ask them, well, what time is it? Oh, I don't know. What season is it? I don't know. And so we only understand it on the surface, not realizing we're to know it to its depth. So here's the thing. I know this is going to come as a shock. Did you know Daniel was Jewish? <laughs> that's, that's what I tell all my listeners and they crack up laughing of course he was Jewish well guess what in Daniel where it talks about the 70 weeks that is 70 Shemitah cycles not any random seven years that could start today or next year it's a Shemitah cycle the whole reason they went into captivity is because they had not kept the Shemitah cycle as God had said Every seventh year, the land was to rest. There was to be an economic reset. And they hadn't done it for 490 years. So if you divide 490 by seven, you get 70 years. The land was supposed to rest that God gave it all at the same time. And so when Daniel's telling us about the 70 weeks of Daniel, and there's one week left where we get the concept of a seven-year tribulation, it can't start any seven-year randomly. It has to be a Shemitah week. And so the tribulation has to begin the first year of a new Shemitah cycle. And if you don't know where we are on the Shemitah cycle, then you don't know when the tribulation could begin. So the possibilities, <clears throat> 2023, and I can't really use 2023, I got to say 2022 through 2023, because the biblical year does not start on January 1st. It starts right. on Tishri 1. So the we are right now in like the third year of a Shemitah cycle. So the tribulation can't begin. It has to begin the first year of a Shemitah cycle. So the next Shemitah cycle begins in its two of our years, 2029, 2030. So that's the next Shemitah cycle. I'm not saying the tribulation will begin in 2029, 2030, 100%, but I think there's a, like a 90% possibility because that's the next first year of a Shemitah cycle. If it doesn't begin then, it can't begin until seven years later. So you don't have to worry about the tribulation beginning any moment or any time. It's on God's pattern. He is organized. Okay. He has specific times. So if you believe in a seven-year tribulation, it has to begin the beginning of a Shemitah cycle, which is why they need to get my book to see all of God's calendar throughout history. Uh, that's what I was going to say, because it, it is, it's a reference book. First, it's going, yeah. it's going to explain all of what we've been talking about and way more. And you're going to see all the patterns. You're going to understand God, God's calendar. And then you're going to see the patterns with the Jubilee and the Shemitah and why certain things can happen and will, and will happen uh, with God's patterns, with God's calendar. And so much of the church is like missing this. Yeah. Yeah. If you remember, it said Daniel prophesied that the... Uh... The Antichrist's main goal is to change the times and the seasons. 
that he wants you to miss your date with God. That's why we all of a sudden have all these pagan, the pagan calendar and the sun determining Easter rather than the sun and the moon determining when the resurrection is. If you're in competition with someone and you're at a restaurant and then you leave and you accidentally left your day timer there, the best thing that your competition can do is run over, erase the time of this important meeting you're having and put a different time in. And so you'll miss the appointment when you go back to get your book and you pick it up. You're going to look at the schedule and the time's been changed. The devil's whole mission is for us to miss the appointed time. So he's he's had a, the church on the wrong calendar for the last 2000 years. Absolutely. And Jesus, uh, you know, fulfilled the spring feasts. Yes. To the his... day, to the hour. Uh, here's Let me just give you a quick listeners, if you don't mind, for just a quick second. I love it. <clears throat> no parent would want their child to die before them. Well, guess what? God the Father is having his son die. And so God, from the beginning of the universe, he said, I'm going to determine what day my son's going to die. I'm going to determine what time he's going to die. I'm even going to determine what songs will be sung at his funeral. So he predetermined when Messiah was going to die, which is why for 1,500 years, the Jews killed the lamb on Nisan 14. They were dress rehearsals for what was going to happen when Messiah came. And then a thousand years before Jesus was born, King David wrote the funeral hymn for his funeral. And for a thousand years, the Jews practiced singing the funeral hymns before he died on Nisan 14. In the Gospels, it says how they sang a hymn at the Last Supper, went over to the Mount of Olives. I know the words to the song they sang. Most Christians have no idea. I know what they sang. The reason why is because every Passover, they sing the Hallel, Psalm 113 through Psalm 118. Psalm 118 is the last hymn, every Passover. So the words that they sang right before he was betrayed and rejected, in Psalm 118, they sang, this is the stone the builders have rejected. I mean, this is what they're singing. And then the next day at nine in the morning, every Passover, they sing the Hallel three times. Nine in the morning, noon, three in the afternoon. At nine in the morning, at the very moment, <clears throat> they're binding Yeshua to the cross. And there's two million pilgrims there. Can you imagine a two million member choir singing the songs all at once? <laughs> While they're binding Messiah to the cross, the high priest is binding the Passover lamb to the horns of the altar. And Jesus hears everyone singing Psalm 118, Bind the sacrifice with cords, even to the horns of the altar. That's what they're singing at the very moment. He's being bound and the Passover lamb's being bound. And then at noon, when the lights go out, they're singing Psalm 118. Here he is suspended between heaven and earth on the cross. And the worst of the song is Psalm 118 is, the right hand of the Lord is being lifted up. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. That's what's going on. And then at three is the time of the evening sacrifice, okay? And they're slaying the Passover lamb. And the high priest would say, it's finished. Well, this is then Messiah. He passes away. And the last words that he hears everybody singing is in Psalms. May the Lord's mercies endure forever. May the Lord's mercies. I mean, it's just God choreographed everything from the beginning of history. Wow. Wow. So, so here he's fulfilling all the spring feasts and so many more details that we've yes. all missed that you're yeah. talking about, but his second coming is about the fall feasts. And, exactly. yet, the church, and yet the church is like, ah, it's not for me. Um, well, isn't Jesus's second coming for you? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm not getting this. So well, that's I, so important. Well, the Christians all say he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hmm. Well, if that's the case, if he fulfilled the spring feast to the day, to the hour, then he'll fulfill the fall feast to the day and to the hour. And the next feast is the Feast of Trumpets. This is the tribulation beginning. This is the resurrection of the dead. I would think that would interest the Christians because can you imagine? See, at El Shaddai, we keep all the feasts. And I believe what happens on heaven is happening on earth. There's a war in heaven. Okay, there's war on earth. And, and so uh, I, on Rosh Hashanah, we'll have a thousand people together and we're celebrating the coronation of God. I ask how many people want to go to the wedding? 
Well, should you go to the wedding rehearsal then? And that's what the feasts are. It's the same thing. Who wouldn't want to be at the coronation of the king? Well, that's Rosh Hashanah. And so we actually go through the coronation of the king, sing the coronation songs. We worship and praise the Lord. And some year, someday at that very moment, see, I believe the heavenlies practice the feast. In the heavens, they're practicing God's entrance into this planet. And so they're all up there worshiping and praising the king. The very same moment we're here on earth, and at some moment, boom, we'll be right carried into the presence of the heavenly chorus, coronating God, and no one will know on earth the Christians. And so we need to understand when God wants us to meet if we want to be at his coronation and at his wedding. Right. And in the, in the Bible, um, it, it says that these appointed times are rehearsals. I mean, yes. they, they yes. actually say that's the <laughs> Hebraic meaning that yes. they're rehearsals. And so, Mark, but if someone says, I just don't even know how to do it, what do I do? Um, um, they definitely need to, you know, we're going to have your a ministry link um, in the description. And so then so then they can understand what if they can't travel to where you are? What can people do? Yeah, well, what's important, too, and in some of my other books, I tell people how to do the feast. But the main thing is they can go online. They can join us because we always do it live. We have people all over the world joining us during uh, the Rosh Hashanah service. But uh, the main thing is don't think you have to do it perfectly. You don't have to do it perfectly. Do it in your own way, however you want to do it, but just acknowledge it so God knows you care about uh, his time schedule. But we have videos of our seders uh, and uh, our feasts all online. Anyone can go to esm.us, go to our website, and they we have years of videos, and they can see how we do it. Uh, but the main thing is acknowledge it. You don't don't think you have to do it perfectly. Um, okay, I wanted to know if you can just lead people. Some people who are watching, they don't know Messiah. If you could just oh, sure pray for them. Oh, I'd, I'd love to pray for them. Um, Father, Yeshua, I just pray right now that those who don't know you would realize you are their true heavenly father. They're children and they need to go home. And you're welcoming them home, just like the prodigal son. Father, any son or daughter of yours that wants to turn back to you, I just pray right now that they know you love them. Even in their sin, you love them, but you do want them to repent. You want them to come home and you are so waiting for them. And so, Father, I just pray that you would work in them both to will and to do of your good pleasure that they would know it is truly a true loving home that they are returning to. And they need to quit running away from you. And I just pray, Lord, that your spirit would speak to each and every one of them, that they would realize they can just fall in love with you. You are their precious father and you love them so much. And I just pray right now that each one of them would turn to you in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. And um, OK, so I'm just going to ask you one other question, Mark. You know, a lot of people hearing about the end times, they're just very fearful. But you're so full of joy. Yeah. And uh, OK, what's your secret? Well, uh, my secret is uh, I use the word faith, but it's really trust. Uh, I've almost died so many times. I've had guns at my head twice and they said they're going to blow my head off. I've uh -oh. almost I was almost eaten by lions in Africa just a few years ago. Oh, oh yeah. I, oh, yeah. Oh, it's crazy. OK, we're going to have to have you back uh, talking about some of that. <laughs> But uh, yeah, no, I've almost died so many times. I realize it's not going to happen. God has already pre-numbered my days and it's not going to happen until he says. And when it does happen, I can't do anything about it. So for me, I, I love God so much that uh, I, I don't I have no fear. I have no fear of death. I, I really don't. Uh, but it's I think more people are afraid of how they're going to die <laughs> than the death itself, maybe. But uh, for me, I, it's all about increasing your relationship with God. It's drawing close to God. That's all I can say. The number one thing, uh, there's some things that are coming that you can't do anything about. But the main thing is, you know, if you're right with God, it doesn't matter. You know, yeah, amen, because it's the thing is, if you really have a relationship with the Lord, then you're walking in his presence. Right. And 
you can have the scariest things happen to you but when you're when you're in his presence he's protecting you he said he would never exactly. leave you or forsake you exactly and, well mark thank you so much for being on the program you and bet. everyone has to get his book and again it's in the description uh, one thing i want to bring out jane for all of your listeners and uh, i really support what you're doing and you uh oh my goodness people ought to be so appreciative that they're listening to you so they can hear this warning and get this book but for your listeners uh they don't have to give us any money, no money at all. We don't have the book in stock just yet. We'll be having it in stock about the first week of March. But if any of your listeners call our office at uh, 253-862-8010, or even better, just email us. Just email us. That's probably the best. Uh, at info at esm.us. And if you tell us you want the book, you'll get it, uh, let's see, for like $15 off. It'll only be twenty four ninety five, dollars uh, And uh, if you want, have them, uh, why don't all of you that want to order this book in advance and say $15, uh, when you call all, uh, call us, let us know you listen uh, to Jane's show. Or when you email us, put it in the email. We will be having you back on soon, so thank you. There is even more prophetic implications regarding the 2024 eclipse. Click this video now so you are prepared for what is coming.